Hello and welcome. This is Lockdown TV from Unheard. We've got a new idea for you today. It's called techno populism. And if, like me, you've been a bit confused and baffled by the politics since the pandemic, this might just help understand it. So, technocracy, ruled by technocrats, means scientists, economists, people in distant international institutions. It's normally thought of as the opposite of populism. Which is politicians brought to power on the back of a majority overturning previous elites. So you might think of Brexit and Donald Trump as good examples of that. But what happens when these two forces fuse? Chris Bickerton, who teaches politics at Queen's College, Cambridge, has just written a book called Techno Populism, and he is here to help explain it. Hi, Chris. Hi, Freddie. So you are author of Techno Populism,、uh, a new book that. Tries to show how technocracy, the technocrats, the rulers by expert, are in some way fused or working in cahoots with the populists. Tell us the the basic premise. Okay, and、um, this this was something that I've been doing for a while, working on this with a colleague of mine based in in New York, Carlo Invernizzi Acetti.、Um, and our basic idea is is the way you described.、Um, Most of us would probably guess that、um, the technocracy, if we think of that as being about giving power to experts, giving them some sort of decision-making power, a bit like we do with、uh, central bankers, give them power to decide interest rates without the politicians getting involved. And if, if we think about technocracy as being really that in broader political decisions, experts are are directly empowered, we would imagine that probably the The most trenchant critics of that way of doing things would be people who think that the people should rule the populists,、um, and I think it would probably be wrong to suggest that this never this clash doesn't exist. I mean, if you look around,、um, it definitely does in some ways.、Um, people who've been following the the climate change debate, for instance, will know that some of the advice by by people like Greta Thunberg has been listen to the science, don't listen to these dangerous populist politicians who tell you that it's not happening.、Um, We've had a bit of a theme over the last couple of years with the、uh, with the corona virus、um, about following the science and not following、uh, these populist politicians like Bolsonaro or Trump.、Um, you and people will remember Michael Gove's famous phrase: "The people have had enough of the expert." Thank you very much,、uh, which he said a few years ago. So, out there in the world, there is this conflict,、um, and I suppose what we're really saying is that if you want to understand contemporary politics and you want to know. And、this is probably one of the basic questions of politics. What is the struggle about?、Um, what we're saying is that the struggle today in the democratic states that that we know,、um, the UK, Western Europe,、uh, North America, it's not the old style left versus right.、Um, it really is this attempt to combine in different ways popular appeal,、uh, this need for charisma, this need to be close to to the people, to have this、um, popular touch, with Some sort of demonstrable form of competence and expertise, and the politician that can get those two together, and it's not an easy th- synthesis,、um, but the one who can can win.、Uh, that's really the the message, I suppose. So, the the example that is most striking, perhaps, is the one here in the, here in the UK, which is Boris Johnson and his Conservative government that was elected as a populist government. The Brexit movement. Was all about rejecting the distant technocrats in Brussels and all of these unelected officials that claimed expertise over our lives. And Boris Johnson was going to be the tribune of the people. And now, suddenly, since the pandemic hit, he surrounds himself with scientists. He doffs his cap to their superior authority. And there's a real sense of a bit of confusion there. How come he, the the, the populist, is suddenly Mr. Technocrat? Yeah, I, I remember. I mean, if we cast our minds back to、um, the, you know, the beginning of the of 2020, those first few months,、uh, February, March, that was when、um, the pandemic was really kicking off, and the first lockdown in the UK, I think, was、uh, in the beginning of March.、Um, I, I do remember there being quite a lot of discussion by, by I suppose, sort of punditry, kind of journalistic comment, people sort of、uh, commenting on politics, really trying to wonder what was going on,、um, because. Johnson had always been seen as this、uh, politician that was fairly clownish, fairly unserious,、um, definitely had a populist uh, touch. Um, and you're absolutely right, Fred. If you go back to the 2019 election, just afterwards,、um, 
this was the people's government, it was going to be a people's budget, this was, um, you couldn't take the prefix of the people, you know, out of the, the Johnson government after that election, it was absolutely everywhere. Um, but then you had this pivot towards an embrace of science. Um, now, some of it was driven by just the, the, the situation in, 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 in emergency situations, in crisis situations, people who are experts in whatever's going on are clearly who you turn to. Um, but um, I think it, it was confusing because we had just misunderstood the nature of Johnsonianism, if you want to call it that, as a political phenomenon. Um, so back in that December 2019 election, what Johnson was promising was actually not just to deliver what the people want, the people's will, as expressed in the majority in the referendum. It was more than that. It was in getting it done. Um, it was in being efficient. It was in delivering. And that promise to deliver uh, is really a, a classically technocratic one about pro solving the problem, sorting it out. Um, so I think Johnson, always from the beginning, combined those two things. Um, himself as a person, he clearly has this affable sort of clownish element, which I think creates a basis for, oddly enough, some sort of sense of uh, uh, popular connection with people. But what was driving his uh, his politics and his government uh, at the end of 2019 was this you know, real commitment to, to push through all the institutional blockages and to deliver on Brexit. And the people around him were really hammering that message home. So I think from the outset, Johnson was not just a populist. What was successful for him was actually his ability to deliver. Um, and it was that combination. So that is what made me think the whole Bre Get Brexit Done slogan did have a techno-populist quality to it. So we can't proceed any further in this conversation without naming Dominic Cummings. So this is the advisor to Boris Johnson, who was seen as an absolutely key part of the successful Brexit campaign. This is the guy who, in theory, understands the world outside Westminster, is in touch with what the people really want, and that's been the source of his success. Suddenly, if the evidence he's just given to the select committee is enough to go by, he's now rejecting the democratically elected prime minister and people around him in favour of scientists, mathematicians, people with PhDs, modellers, who he thinks should really be in charge during a crisis like this. So more than anyone, he represents your techno-populism, doesn't he? Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, I've always found him an interesting figure. Um, you always have um, in sort of the course of history around, you know, leaders, advisors, these figures, sometimes slightly shadowy. Um, it's just a constant feature of politics to have these um, uh, these figures that stand in the background, but in retrospect seem very important. Um, so some of the, uh, the the cloak and dagger element around Dominic Cummings is just has always been like that, where, you know, power attracts th that sort of discussion. However, um, it would be wrong to not ask ourselves more about the actual content of what he thinks. Um, uh, and there, I think it's really quite specific and quite um, particular to the era in which we live in. Um, you know, Cummings, on the one hand, politically has made his career by um, very successfully pushing this anti-elite, anti-politician, anti-establishment message. Um, he's been involved in not just the 2016 referendum, he's involved in, in past referendums. He was um, uh, really quite... Uh, instrumental in that much earlier referendum in, I think it was 2004, uh, for an assembly in the Northeast, which didn't go through. And one of the messages that he sort of cultivated in that particular referendum was, you know, why should we just pay for another sort of talking shop? This is just politicians trying to um, create extra institutions that aren't, in, aren't useful for people. Uh, so that's been part of his, um, I suppose, his life and his worldview for a long time. But you can't um, ignore this whole other dimension, which is you know, uh, an absolute fascination with technology, uh, technological solutions to problems. Um, one of his comments when he first arrived at Downing Street was um, he went into uh, the room where the cabinet meets and he was struck by how there was not a single element of technology in there whatsoever. You know, there was a fire, which in the past had been used to sort of burn uh, secret documents. There was a clock on the mantelpiece that didn't even work. You know, he was shocked at how technologically unsavvy it was as a as a room at the heart of government. So for him, you know, politics is really about uh, policy delivery um, corresponding directly to popular will. That, that's it. And for me, that's really, you know, the essence of, uh, of techno populism. If you like, it's, it's what we might call an unmediated form of politics. There is nothing that stands in between 
the, the leader who enacts the popular will and its ability to deliver. There's n all the stuff that's in between is just not legitimate and not, not necessary. And that's really what Cummings is all about. And it's no coincidence that on the one hand, he's you know, an instrumental figure in what we think of as Britain's populist politics, but his main beef with Johnson and his seven hour you know, denunciation of the, of the performance throughout the pandemic was incompetence. It wasn't anything else. It was that it was not done well. So what you describe in the book is that there's actually something that unites the populist and the technocrats, which is their shared hatred or shared lack of respect for the political class, because the populists feel they have the authority of what the people think, and the technocrats feel that they have the authority of expertise. And both of those are collectively withering about politicians. Is that... Is that at the heart of this? Yes, that's right. The, it's, it's just as you described. Um, the question is really, what is it that um, that both the technocrats and the populists dislike about party politics? And the way that um, I understand it is that um, party politics is inherently, if you think about the way politicians relate to one another and the way that they compete for power, it's inherently relativistic, uh, which is to say it's not really about truth. It's about different sets of values. Uh, you may be more in favor of um, individual liberty. I may be more in favor of, um, uh, of more equality across society. Those are different positions. Neither you nor, nor I are wrong in a sense or right. We just have different starting points. And party politics is about seeing if you can get enough votes for your point of view. Um, but the other side is legitimate. They're just, uh, they just have a different point of view. If you think about techno-populism and you think about the view of the populist and the view of the technocrat, um, it's rather different. It's a politics of truth. Uh, truth lies in the people's will incarnated by somebody who can understand that will, a leader, or truth lies in the right policy solution, if you like, the right solution to a problem as given the, by, the, by, by, the, by the available evidence. So it's not a politics where you can accept that the other side is legitimate, just disagreeing with you. They are just wrong. And so this politics of right and wrong, this politics of competing truth claims is what unites technocrats and populists. That's also how they think of politics. It's the domain of truth and of being right and wrong. Tr establishment politi politicians don't really act in that way. And so there's a real antipathy there. So you might almost call that kind of absolutist. Um, and in that sense, it's quite scary, isn't it? I mean, you know, whether you say that this science is correct and anyone who deviates from it is wrong and must be silenced, which has definitely happened over the past 15 months, or whether you say, well, we have the vote of the majority and therefore anyone who thinks anything different must be squished. Both of those are absolutist and quite frightening positions and they don't involve any kind of pluralist accommodation of different values at all. Yeah, so as a form of politics, techno-populism is definitely anti-pluralist. Um, what we try and say in the book is that it's not um, it's not uh, anti-democratic as such. It's not, a, it's not a threat to the very existence of democracy. What it involves is politicians competing for power through elections. So in that sense, um, it's very much within democratic politics, but it has this strong anti-pluralist element to it. But that's the politics of it. If you ask many scientists, they tell you that the work that they do isn't like that. They're constantly refining their hypotheses and trying to work out whether they're right or wrong. And it's deeply sort of pluralist, if you like, and the kind of commitments they make are never absolutist, they're only ever provisional. But when you translate this um, sense of expertise into politics, it takes on this absolutist form of a politics of truth. And then reunited with the populists, it becomes very powerful. Um, and I think it goes some way, I think, to explaining why politics has become, uh, as people often say, so toxic. Um, if you think about it, if your political opponent just disagrees with you, then fair enough, and you just have a different sort of view of the world. But if you genuinely feel that they are they are wrong, then there's very little basis for debate. Uh, and so politics becomes this constant denunciation of the absolute error of the opponent and becomes very vitriolic and very um, and very toxic. So I think that explains a lot of the current political you know, atmosphere. It's not disagreements as such. It's just thinking in a way that doesn't accept the basis of, uh, of pluralism. And the pandemic must have fast forwarded all of that. I mean, you started thinking about this book in 2012. You must have been amazed in the past year how right your interests proved to be because, you know, now with the atmosphere of people dying and there being a serious illness, 
the kind of moral energy behind not allowing anyone to disagree with you was that much greater, and it became pretty much universally acceptable to, you know, to not question the government's position. Yes, that's right. I think the the scope for debate over the last eighteen months or so um, has been always hemmed in by some sense that. Um, and again, let me just stress, if you talk to a lot of scientists, they don't say that this is the way that they think about things. But the way it's being brought into our politics is in the following way, that there's some sort of hard evidence out there that is incontrovertible and incontestable. And that's just the way things have to be. Um, and I think that's done a lot of damage for our politics. I and mean, you could imagine we've made choices over the last 18 months, very significant choices about how we manage the pandemic. Um, those choices have influenced, or rather those choices have affected different sections of society, you know, really very differently. Um, there's been, to put no finer point on it, a massive wealth transfer from a younger generation to an older generation. Um, now, I'm not saying these decisions were necessarily wrong, but you'd have thought that there would have been the kind of issues around which you would have really substantive um, debates where you can really see the options available. Um, and I don't really think that's the way it's happened, partly because we've had this um, this straitjacket, if you like, of following the science and assuming that the science is just in the interest of everybody. And that really is this, we also call this in the book, the politics of generality. That's techno-populism. Rather than thinking in terms of who is affected, in what way, what are the different groups thinking, what are the different interests involved in having to try and manage, manage those. So we've had this huge number of scientists become semi-politicians in the past year and a half, haven't we? And then there was that slight giveaway moment in Dominic Cummings' testimony when he said what he would have liked to see happen was a modeler, a mathematical modeler, be appointed a dictator or king during the period of the pandemic just to overrule the elected representatives with their faffing and their, their lack of swift decisions. And that seems to me why it's dangerous, because if you fast forward this way of thinking, you lead to a kind of tyran tyrannical government um, where it's all governed from the center by some kind of claim to absolute truth. Yes, I think those are the kind of things which um, I think are definitely constrained by the British political system. Um, but what Cummings is explaining is quite interesting is, so on the one hand, I think he has this sense of being against the establishment because he thinks it's not really what people want. Um, but he also there was expressing one of the typical tropes, the old sort of tropes, if you like, of technocracy, not really technopopulism here. We're talking about the association of techni skill with Kratos power. Um, and there is obviously a history in the relationship of technocracy, which is deeply anti-democratic. Um, you know, Plato's conception of uh, of technocracy, of the idea that those with the, the techni, the philosopher kings should rule, was directly opposed to some idea that rule should be invested in, in the people. And for a long time, um, I mean, there were various movements, technocracy movements across the, the last two to 300 years that were never very successful politically. Um, but sometimes you get some of this technocratic utopianism, utopianism, if you like, in places like Silicon Valley where they think that you can just get rid of politics altogether and just have it run by tech experts. Um, and uh, Dominic Cummings definitely has some aspect of that to him. Um, but I think what worked in terms of him as a political phenomenon was his association with, uh, with Johnson um, and with, if you like, electoral politics. Um, I don't think um, uh, maybe that's what he would have liked to have just had a scientist in charge. But I think um, th what's really going on is not the transfer of power away from politics towards experts, but the politicization of expertise. That, I think, is what we've been really seeing over the last 18 months. And I don't know what you think about this, but to me what has been most surprising is that you can sort of understand how people on the actual left would be okay with a kind of big government program to uh, control everything in face of a threat like coronavirus. You could sort of understand how the, the right-wing authoritarians might like that as well. There's a threat, we need a kind of military-style government, war footing, etc. And Cummings basically belongs in that group. The surprise has been that the guys in the middle, the, the erstwhile Remainers, centrists, technocrats, basically, the people who considered themselves liberals, suddenly just had, had very little interest in due process, in human rights, in other questions of you know, moderation, and were totally signed up to what 
by any historical accounts, was quite an extreme government program. I think, um, it, I mean, it has been difficult, I think, how to act politically in what seems to be exceptional times. Um, and there's always a kind of separate politics, if you like, of of, the, of crises or of exceptions, where uh, typical ways of doing things seem to be thrown to one side and um, something different uh, happens. And if you're unhappy with it, then, you you know, if you criticise it, then you're criticised for getting in the way of what has to be done to solve this big crisis. So I, I can understand that in what we might call crisis politics, uh, some forms of opposition are actually quite difficult to sustain. Um, what I think is interesting is going to be the legacy, to be honest. It's, it's more the post-pandemic dimension. My feeling is that many of these issues that we're talking about, especially this role that scientific expertise has come to play in our, in our politics, combined with these appeals to everybody, these political programs that are not tailored to particular groups, but just are seen as being in, in the interest of everyone, when in practice nothing really can be in the interest of, uh, of everyone, how that plays out in the post-pandemic era, my feeling is, is that a lot of this will stay with us. Um, and one of the problems I think is going to, that's going to come up is that there's definitely a difficulty in for expertise, for technocrats, when they become drawn into politics, um, for them to maintain their legitimacy. Because at the end of the day, one of the things that makes scientists legitimate is precisely that they're not acting as politicians. They're outside of politics and what they provide is advice, but they don't come across as being partisan or in favor of one party or another. Now, as um, experts are drawn into politics, if you think about people like Mario Draghi in Italy, I and mean, he's now governing the country, um, his authority, uh, and this is actually the case in, in the US, central bankers now becoming real politicians. Um, uh, somebody runs the Fed and then becomes the Treasury Secretary. Uh, their authority comes from their expertise outside of politics. And when they start to act in politics, they become criticized in the way that politicians are, and they lose some of that legitimacy that they get from being the experts. So it's not clear to me how much of this, um, uh, uh, tech, this, this technocratic aspects of our politics can survive over time because it seems to lose its, its legitimacy, but it's certainly here to stay for the time being. So they might lose their legitimacy in the public mindset, but it doesn't stop them enforcing their laws, right? So they, they still have the, the power. And I wonder whether we should be talking about China in this conversation. I mean, we've talked about, constantly talking about the people. That happens quite a lot in China. We're talking about a very technological-based government where you know people are hooked up to apps and there's more and more of a sense of technology playing a part in government and these kind of expertises i mean are we becoming more chinese so people have often, have often asked me that which is does techno populism only exist in democratic states does it not seem to characterize quite successfully in non-democratic states and people have often mentioned china um you can have a regime that rests its legitimacy on its ability to deliver for um, in policy terms and its ability in some way to better understand what the people want without having to go through the process of parliamentary politics or party politics, but to do that in some other way, which in China is through the <clears throat> is through the Communist Party and its relations down to all the different levels of Chinese society and its ability to identify what people want uh, in that way. Um, Yes, I think definitely these aspects exist. Um, I would be less <clears throat> likely to think that in some way we're, we're becoming like that. Um, I think the problem that certainly British democracy face, faces now and what democratic states, advanced democratic states like the US or, or in Western Europe, the problems that we face is, um, is more that we have the continuation of political competition, um, but we have a kind of political competition that is uh, deeply anti-pluralist, therefore <clears throat> very confrontational, very polarized. Um, but at the same time, it's not always clear that there's actually something substantive that we're disagreeing about. It's not as if we're in the age where politicians are providing us with radically different visions of society. We have no party in, this, in, the, in the United Kingdom that's promising to socialize the means of production. Those debates are gone. So these big differences between uh, what politicians are offering us have really narrowed down to much more minor differences. Um, and yet we don't have the language to understand that. We, we, are, we are presented with these different combinations of 
a bit more competence here and a bit more of a populist touch there. Uh, but the actual substance of political debate seems to me to have narrowed quite a lot. Those, those I think, it's not to say that I think we're transitioning into a different regime, but it's more the kind of politics that we're faced with is not very satisfying. And I suppose the things that do get attention in a techno-populist future are the measurable things. And of course, coronavirus has been the perfect example of that. You know, we've been had endless charts. Uh, and in fact, it almost seems like competition between countries because we now have this universally measurable thing, despite the complications of doing it, which is how many people have been got sick and died of COVID-19. And suddenly it's almost a competition between countries who can perform better by that single metric and other things that don't show up on charts, quality of human relationships, freedom to go about your business unencumbered, they don't really feature so much in this new world. Do you, are you worried that those kind of values are being lost? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think that's exactly right. I mean, there's a kind of metrification of our politics, which skewers our attention towards those things that are susceptible to being measured in that way. Uh, and there are other things that simply aren't. Um, one of the big problems, if you frame politics as being about problem solving, um, and this combination of problem solving and being able to have this really personal relationship to, to people. The problem with problem solving is that um, it's not a disagreement about what you want to do, it's about how you achieve it. Um, and so you end up not really discussing anymore what the actual goal is, what the ends are, what your final sort of purpose is. It's just about, you know, did you do this well or did you do this less well? As you were saying with, um, with the case of the pandemic, you have these set parameters of what you want to achieve and then it's all a discussion of how you get there. Actually, politics, if you want to make politics really come alive for people, it's about ends. It's not about the means. It's about where do you want to go? What sort of society do you want to live in? Um, and I think the more we have this problem solving sort of orientation in our politics, one, it's just going to be this endless set of metrics. And it's really just going to be discussing the means, not the ends. And I think we have to go back to a politics of of ends uh, to be able to have these debates. So which is about reconciling different groups within society that don't agree, admitting that they don't agree. And I suppose it's about discussing bigger values that, that we want to prioritize. That's what you mean when you say a politics of ends. Absolutely. Yeah. What sort of society do we want to live in? Um, and uh, understanding that whatever we do, society is made up of lots of different generations for a start, people with different experiences, different positions. These conflicts are ongoing, but we're not really sort of um, uh, mobilizing around them enough, I think. Um, and also just these, you know, real questions about what, what exactly is it that we're trying to achieve and what sort of society do we want to do we want to live in? That, I think, over the last 18 months, I feel that that sort of um, debate has, has almost been lost entirely to just one that's focused on just a very specific set of parameters. So we've got this situation where governments like the current one in the UK that were elected on a populist mandate to kind of restore, it was literally take back control was the ultimate uh, motto that, that led them to power, have now sort of joined forces with a technocratic mindset. And there's actually a little quote from your book I wanted to read out because it, it made me shudder, to be honest. Uh, and it said it was looking forward to the future and what the outcomes of this new techno-populism might be, it is likely to become more Hobbesian, that is, to rely on physically repressive means. This is a development that has been widely observed by political commentators in connection with phenomena such as mass incarceration, increasing levels of surveillance and policing, and the rise of the so-called security state. So there's a sort of right or wrong policy which experts need to enforce you're not allowed to disagree with it. And these are the kind of tools that governments will increasingly reach to to enforce it. Is that, is that what's happening? Well, I think the, the role of state power in all of this is really interesting. Um, as I said, if, you, if you're not disagreeing about ends, we're having a debate about ends and it's just about the means, it's really a debate about the capacities of the state. Um, and there I think it's very problematic because what if you don't think that's what the state should be doing? What if you don't think it should be investing its money in, as, as you just quoted, um, locking more and more people up? Um, it may be able to do it, but is that the right thing that we should be doing? Um, so I think going back to those sorts of debates, you know, think of them as sort of first principle debates. Um, 
that's what kind of gives a, animates our our politics. And I do think techno populism definitely can take the form of a more oppressive form of politics, precisely because it doesn't really question the exercise of state power. It actually assumes the exercise of state power. It's just about how good the state can accomplish its task, whatever those tasks may may be. So if the, the competition is just what a, what's the greatest capacity of the state that suggests an ever expanding state and the people we used to call libertarians uh, who were constantly worried about the state getting too big they don't really get a look in i mean actually if you look at british politics over the past year and a half there's been a sort of rump of tory mps who have been trying to kind of object to some of the more repressive measures but they've not been a seriously influential force voices talking about liberty don't really feature in a techno-populist future. I think the good, I mean, a certain example there is, I think, Cummings, which is that um, Cummings, in, in some sense, always had a libertarian element to him. It was very anti uh, the traditional instruments of the state, at least, trying to break up the, the, the hold that Westminster has on the British state, um, trying to do things in, in new ways. Um, deformalize everything and take on the the, the mandarins and whitehall um, and that's definitely not the it's not what he managed to do um, i think in many ways uh, he was pushed out partly because of the scale and the scope of what he was actually trying to trying to do um, so yeah I, I don't think there's much evidence of a pushback against an expanding state i mean in, in principle <clears throat> i'm not for or against a, a, a strong state i just think that um, we need to make sure that we're having an argument about what we think the state should be doing, um, rather than just uh, assuming that we know the answer to that and we're just trying to work out how it can how it can get there. And there's, there's, we've got to have that prior argument as well. And that's why you need libertarians you need libertarians to really question whether we actually want to go there in the first place. And then the, liber the argument against the libertarians is that these endless opinion polls, at least during the pandemic, have shown that huge majorities of people support the most repressive measures um, for a feeling of security. So actually, it's popular, it's populist to uh, have an authoritarian government in some way. Do you do you buy that? Well, I think it's definitely um, my impression is that over the last, I suppose, three to four, <clears throat> three to four decades, um, we've had, if you like, the the emergence and the curating of pretty risk averse societies for lots of different reasons. Um, and I have been struck, I think, by the way that risk aversion has worked its way out across the uh, across the course of the pandemic, yes. Um, so I don't think it would be right to say that this was done against the wishes of people at all. Um, I think uh, we have, if you like, the, the, the existence of a certain sense of vulnerability that I think has become a, an entrenched feature of our society. Not to do necessarily, I think, with the actual threats that are out there, but I think more to do with various kinds of social atomization and social disaggregation that make people feel vulnerable if they don't have many connections to, to other people. That, I think, is really at the root cause of it. But that's definitely a thing that, that exists. And I think that's reinforced some of the measures that have been taken over the last 18 months. Do you think it's over the top to look at previous revolutions in history when thinking about the last few years. I mean, you think of whether it's the Russian Revolution or the Iranian Revolution in 79, what you quite often get is a first wave, which is all, you know, one version of people power, and a second wave that follows soon after, which is where those same people or their, their quick successes appeal to a new authority, and it turns out, whoops, careful what you wish for, this was supposed to be a great kind of um, freedom or people power moment and suddenly we find ourselves oppressed by a new authority. Do you see any analogy to that in, in for example, the UK government? Uh, I, I wouldn't use the term revolution, no. Um, I don't think we're in uh, any sort of situation that would be historically comparable. Um, I think <clears throat> we've certainly uh, gone through what seems to be some quite significant changes. Um, we have to wait and see, I think, about the extent to which things really change in the post-pandemic era. Um, I've certainly found that um, as things have opened up, uh, the idea that it would be very difficult to adjust back again into a society where people actually interact with one another, I've not experienced that, certainly not personally. Um, it may be that we transition back to the society that very much we were before. Um, 
measures that have been taken, some exceptional measures, emergency measures uh, may not remain either. Um, but I think there will be a legacy. Uh, what that is exactly, I'm not sure. I think it's, to be honest, I think it's not so much in the domain of what you were describing. Um, things to do with about the changing nature of work, I think some of the spatial impacts, mobility impacts are going to be huge and really long term. But again, I don't think those are necessarily um, those are necessarily negative. Um, I don't think it's been a revolution. I think in some ways um, a revolution requires too much determination, will and agency, too much clarity about where you want to go. Um, and I think that's not really what we what we have particularly. I think there's a lot of uncertainty. And I don't think tech, one of the features about techno populism, to be honest, is um, is that um, it's not very revolutionary. Um, Revolutions require groups, social groups, that identify very power, powerfully and deeply with a particular idea and want to realize that idea against really enormous odds. Um, that's not the society that corresponds to techno-populism, I think. Um, it's a much more individuated, fragmented society where the formation of groups with clear ideologies like that don't really, don't really exist, I don't think. Do you think, ultimately, if competence though, is the, the sort of overriding goal of government. And that's what all these different strands seem to unite around. Anything that increases the competence of government will be very hard to argue against. And that, I guess that's more what I'm getting at, that you know, we, we hear a lot about, you know, are we headed towards a more sort of Chinese style of government? And that's why people are worried about online vaccine passports and the surveillance state and all of that. I just wonder, in this techno-populist era, how will measures like that, that might increase the competence and capacity of government, but would just make life slightly less fun or make the country slightly less of a nice place to live in, how will that argument play out? And you know, does it stand a chance? Well, so I think I mean that I think to the extent that competence is what really matters, it's um, it's hard to argue for incompetence, uh, and so any sort of opposition to it is is not con is delegitimized by default, and that's one of the big problems. One of the ways to tackle it would be to not actually even accept the language of competence in the first place, and to try and repoliticize our sort of political debate, if you like, or to bring back certain sense, you know, certain arguments about ideas and about values rather than about, you know, whether we're doing it well enough. Um, but it's also worth remembering that, to be honest, the key is not just competence on its own. Um, it's competence in addition, to, added to which you need to have this, uh, this sense of being in touch with people. I think that matters as much, actually, as people um, uh, thinking that you're competent. So if you think about the difficulties that Starmer's had, Starmer's had a lot of problems because I think he was appointed partly because he was seen as this forensic critic of Johnson, really able to man master the details, a man who can master his brief. But you know, that certainly has failed on the whole other dimension of techno-populism, which is an ability to appeal to, to the people. Um, and so if you can find somebody, you know, somebody like Andy Burnham probably is a better option for Labour because he does seem to combine those two, those two things much better. Um, but so it's not just about competence, it's also about this popular touch, but it's not just about the popular touch if you can't also in some way convince people that you will make their day-to-day -day life better. Um, the only way to sort of transform the debate is to come at it from the outside. It's not about having a bit more populism and a bit less technocracy, it's about coming completely from the outside and saying we need to have a debate about where we want to go in the first place. So is the final question then, Chris, what we should think about politicians? Because if it's the technocrats who hate the politicians because they're not competent enough and the populists hate them because they're out of touch and hopeless, are we now coming full circle to the weird position where we need to remake the case for politicians? And we need more of them, not less than them. I never thought I'd say it, but is that where we're getting to? So I would, I would, I would tend to agree with you. Um, I would put it in this way. I would say that we need to defend once again or in some way rediscover what we understand to be party democracy, um, which is to say <clears throat> we accept we live in a representative democracy. I don't think you or my, you know, we're not both going to suddenly do politics from nine till sort of, you know, 12 at night and nor are most people in the country. So we live in a system where we accept to represent, to delegate our will, if you like, to representatives. 
However, what is it that makes that system democratic? It's, dem it's only democratic if those parties present to us real choice, real choice about how we want to run our society. And as far as I can tell, what we should be trying to do is to impress on the parties and in some way to be involved so that the parties can do that, which is to present us once again with these real choices. I don't think we should be doing what the populists or the technocrats do, which is to try and push aside the whole party system altogether and to have a kind of techno-populist politics where we just have these direct relations between the population as a whole and our elected uh, governments. I think we do need the party system because in a representative democracy, parties provide us with choice. And that, I think, is ultimately the most important thing. Chris Bickerton, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. That was Chris Bickerton, author of Techno Populism, which is out now. He was trying to explain there how forces that we used to think of as opposed, the technocratic forces of expertise and appeals to that kind of truth, versus the populist forces of power to the people representing the ordinary man, they have now fused into what might become quite a serious new trend. And if you've got a feeling of a new world order being brought into existence, the techno-populist world order sounds about right. So thanks to Chris, and thanks for watching. This was Lockdown TV.